Brother Lefevre, come on up here a wee minute. <laughs> See, when you're a missionary, you've got to be prepared yeah. for everything, right? And Brother Zach Lefevre is one of our missionaries in the land of Bulgaria. And yeah. he's been back just about a little over about two weeks now, I guess. Weeks, yeah. So we'll have, an opportunity. we'll have him preach for us at some point in the future. Give us a brief testimony okay. about for a few weeks. Well, I'm glad you didn't call on me to sing. <laughs> but, but it's good to be here this evening. Um, we're back just for a short visit for a couple months. Maggie, my daughter's here today. She graduated Saturday, had a ceremony. So we're here for her to help her to celebrate with her and to help her get uh, set up and everything. She's going to be staying with her sister Katie in Greenville, South Carolina. And we'll be going back to... Bulgaria, Lord willing, on August the 1st. We're going back there. We work with Turkish people. It's a special group. It's called Milet Turks. They are part Turkish, part Gypsy. They're inter intermingled. There's a lot of Gypsy groups in Europe. Our group is not part of the regular Gypsy. Our group are uh, Muslim, and they are Turkish. And we've seen many of them get saved, and many churches started. Most of our churches are house churches in Bulgaria, where they meet um, not on Sunday because there's so many of them that the pastors can't get to every church on Sunday. So normally on Sunday, but then during the week in the mornings and afternoons, we'll have church in different villages. We have probably about 60 different villages in Bulgaria right now where we have church. This uh, last uh, uh, term that we were on, we saw the Lord bless in our project of working on the Bible. We want to get the Turkish Bible. It's been translated uh, into modern Turkish. And uh, the Lord has really opened up some doors with us for that. We were able to go to Turkey. We found a way that um, we can not only uh, have the Bible printed. We, we would, I would like every family to have a Bible. I would like every family at least to have a family Bible. I believe that uh, every person who reads the Bible is blessed and that God blesses and helps them. Most of our people don't read, however. They're illiterate. They've not been to school but maybe a year or two and they're just not readers. But uh, during COVID, there were, there were blessings that came out of COVID. There were a lot of curses, but, but we don't see how that God works. Even in difficulties, God still works. Amen. The pastor in Bristol, Tennessee said that when he had COVID, that he had that mind fog and he was not able to read the Bible. And it's pretty bad if you're a preacher and you can't concentrate enough to read the Bible. So he said he listened to it, Alexander Scorby. Uh, reading the Bible, and that is such a blessing, and I would recommend finding Alexander Scorby. He's on the internet and listening to the Bible. That is a tremendous blessing. And so we thought about, let's see if we can not only have the Bible translated and printed, we would like to have somebody read it so that people can just, you know, ever <clears throat> any more people don't read books, everybody's got telephones. Everybody's on the phone. And we want the Bible to be read, and we found a place and there's a brother that's working in Turkey, and uh, he got our New Testament, and he got the work done. He went to a radio station, a Christian radio station, one of the very few Christian radio stations in all of Turkey, had the New Testament read uh, professionally, and they are putting it on the internet right now. Right now, they have the book of John that is prepared, and it's ready. You can go to YouTube, and you can, you can watch it, you can listen to it. And they've got the text up as a video and the Bible is being read, and we're continuing with that. We are working on the Old Testament right now, and we praise the Lord for everything that He's done for us. And it's good to be here. And let me mention one other thing. Um, the preacher is going through the book of Revelation on Sunday nights, I believe, and he's going through the letters to the seven churches, which are all in Turkey. And I've been to the locations of all seven of those churches, and it's a blessing to go. It's a blessing to visit. And uh, everything that he teaches about those places is true. I've been there and I've seen it. The pictures are really good. And uh, I would encourage everybody to come on Sunday nights and to yeah. see that. Amen. Amen. And tonight we're doing uh, Pergamos. And we've got a big uh, slide presentation on Pergamos. And I, I learned some things this, in preparation for this message. I didn't know. It's, uh, Pergamos is a tremendous place. And Not one of those kind of churches. Uh, let's take our Bibles. <laughs> Let's take our Bibles and turn to Romans chapter number 12. Romans chapter 12, please. And uh, today we're uh, continuing our series on Discipleship 101. And this is the penultimate message. We have one more message after today, um, which we'll be getting into a very interesting subject next time. And that is 
uh, the area of spiritual gifts. We're going to give you, uh, well, if you have the notes, you already have the spiritual gifts evaluation test, and we're going to be going through that with you. It's kind of interesting, and I hope that you'll enjoy that uh, next time. Uh, but this morning, we're going to read from Romans chapter 12, uh, if you'd like to turn there. And if you're able, would you please stand with me for the reading of God's Word this morning in Romans chapter 12. And we're going to read verse 4 and verse number 5. The Apostle Paul writes, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. And thank you, Lord, for the church that you have established, the relationship as believers that we find together in the communion of saints. And Lord, we're grateful uh, that we can follow you, not just to believe upon you and be saved, but Lord, to follow you and to learn of you, and Lord, to serve you with our lives. And Lord, we understand this is always in the context of the local assembly. So Lord, give us wisdom and understanding concerning the church that you have established. And help us, Lord, in our loyalty to you, to be loyalty, loyal to your program and loyal to the local church. And help us, Lord, to serve you uh, while we have opportunity. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Please be seated, if you will. <clears throat> Well, this morning we're continuing um, our study, and we notice here in these verses, uh, we're reminded of the fact that the church is one body in Christ. Uh, but that one body, just as your physical body is made up of different members, different parts, uh, so it is with the church. Uh, we are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. There's a relationship between all of us together who are saved and who are brought together in the church. Now, he also writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, For as the body is one, and with many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew, Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. And so the church that Paul describes here and the church that Jesus uh, created, uh, of which we are a part, um, is uh, described as the body of Christ. And, uh, and yet we as individuals are members of that body. Uh, the body is not one member, but many. And therefore, we have a relationship together in the body, just as this arm has a relationship to this arm, uh, every part of my body has a relationship to the whole, a relationship to every other part, so it is within the church. Now, we've been studying about discipleship over the last several months, and we saw that the relationship between discipleship, and I won't go back over all of the details of the differences between being a disciple and being a believer. You can be a believer without being a disciple. You can also be a disciple without being a believer. And it's not being a disciple that will take you to heaven. It's being a believer that will take you to heaven. But when we believe upon Christ, he motivates us to, to love him and to serve him and to follow him. And that's what it means to be a disciple. He said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And what we find as we look through the New Testament is that discipleship is instricably linked to the ministry of the local church. Discipleship always takes place in the context of the local church. So the church is really important. And so we try to ask and answer six important questions concerning the church. We ask the question, uh, what is the church? Well, the church is people. So we looked at the people of the church. Uh, the church is made up of people who have trusted Jesus Christ as their personal savior, have made public profession of that faith, and according to the pattern of the New Testament, they followed the Lord and believers' baptism. So they were immersed as a way of uh, acknowledging their testimony of faith in Christ. We saw the purpose of the church, or why does the church exist? Well, the church exists for to glorify God. Uh, the church exists to preach the gospel. The church exists to make disciples of all nations. 
And the church exists to defend the truth of the word of God and of the gospel. So the church has purpose. Then we looked at the precepts of the church or what does the church believe? Well, this is what the church believes. The church believes the Bible, whatever God has said in his word, we are duty bound to believe that and to teach that. Uh, we do not have the luxury to decide what we want to believe and teach or uh, what we don't want to believe uh, and propagate. It's all the word of God. And then we looked at the pastor of the church or who leads the church. And of course, uh, God has given um, qualifications for those who are in leadership. And God calls men to be the, over, the overseers of his flock, the shepherd of the flock, which is the pastor. Then we looked at the practice of the church or what does the church do? And we said that there's really three different directions or relationships of the church. So the church is responsible to exalt God. And our, our vertical relationship with God, we're to exalt the Lord, who is our head and our Lord. We also have a responsibility to the inside of the church. So we are to edify the believers on the inside, exalt the Lord above us, uh, encourage and edify and build up the believers inside the church. We also have a relationship to those who are outside the church. And that is evangelization, we're to take the gospel to those uh, who don't know the Lord. And so uh, every practice of the church should really be in harmony with the purpose of the church the church is not a country club we're not here just to fellowship and socialize although that's part of it um, we are to fellowship but we are, our purpose is, is greater than that so we must uh, do what God has told us to do now today we're looking at the last um, of these six questions and that is what does the church promise now we're looking at the promise of the church uh, this morning and as we consider this question, uh, you know, what does the church promise? We're thinking of the relationship the church has with itself. So now I don't want you to think, well, you know, what's the church promising me? Like the church is over here and they are the church and I'm over here. Now, what are you going to promise me? That's not what this is about. Because what is the church? The church is you. The church is people. And so really the promise of the church is the promise that we make to each other. Did, did you realize that? That in the church assembly. There is a promise when we join a church. When we come into the church fellowship. There is a commitment and a promise. That we're making one to another. And it's, it's not that. Um, you know there's some hierarchy. That we're promising. It's, no the, the church is a body. And the body is made up of different members. We're all equal members. In the body of Christ. Under his headship. And so therefore we have a relationship one with another and there's a commitment and a promise that we make one to another. Now this is what we call the church covenant. <clears throat> and every church has a covenant. Well, every Baptist church usually has a covenant. But it's not just Baptist churches that have it. There's many other churches that would have a church covenant. Some of the older churches you might go into, maybe up on a wall you'd see this big old plaque and it said church covenant. And it actually has it on the wall. Um, when you join our church, you'll get a church constitution, uh, which is the constitution, the articles of faith and the church covenant. And, and of course, what we're doing here in this series is this is really like a new members class that we're doing on Sunday morning. That's why we've got notes and all of that. But the reason we're doing this is because when people are joining the church, they need to understand these things. And maybe you're a member in our church and maybe even every, well, hopefully you've read the church covenant. But I want us to think about what that actually means. Because I think a lot of times either we don't know what it said or we forgot what it said or we don't really understand it or we're not really thinking about it. And it's not really of value or meaning to us. Well, it really is valuable. And that's why we're talking about it this morning. Well, what is a covenant? Well, if you look that up in the dictionary, you're going to find that a covenant is a contract it's a commitment, it's a pledge, and it's a promise. And so when people come together, and this is what this is about, it's a relationship that we have one with another. And when people come together for important purposes, there's, there's certain uh, contracts that can be drawn up. Uh, for example, we just sold our old church building. And when we did that, we had to go before lawyers' offices, and there's all kinds of papers and contracts that we had to fill out and we had to sign and we had to agree upon the, the, we as the sellers had to agree and the buyers had to agree we had to agree what the building was and the property 
boundaries and what was in the building. Does the fridge go? Does it not go? Um, all these are different items that are part of that contract. And really what we're doing there is we're vocalizing expectations. That's what contracts do. Now contracts are important because it helps us to understand what those expectations is. It helps us to understand uh, that the details have been sorted out and that there's a that we can relax because uh, there's there's it's in writing. It's a contract. It's a commitment that has been uh, laid down. Now this is true in, in many areas of life. Uh, for example, if you are a U.S. Uh, a citizen of the United States, which I am. Proud of it. Um, we have, a, we have a, a contract. We have a covenant. Uh, we have a promise. It's called the Constitution of the United States. I don't know if you've ever read it. Um, when you become a citizen of this country, now, now if you're of course you're just crossing the border and you're coming in illegally, you don't have to do any of this. But if you become a citizen of this country, you're required by law not only to read the Constitution, but they're going to test you on it. When I went through my naturalization process, the, there's like a hundred questions that I had to know the answers to. And they would go in there and they would test you on your knowledge of civics and American government and the, and the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States has seven articles. It has 27 amendments. And the first 10 amendments are known as the Bill of, Bill of Rights. And so you got First Amendment things and you have Second Amendment things, which we hear about in the news all the time. But really those are, this is the covenant, this is the promise, this is the arrangement that the people of the United States have with each other. And it's, it helps us to understand what we can expect. It sets forth what we can expect. We can expect that we can uh, meet and that we can um, assemble together without fear of the government splitting us up and running us off into jail. Uh, that we can protest legally against the government if it's peaceful. That we have the right to defend ourselves even with firearms and all these different uh, things. That we See, that's a contract. That's helping us. That's a promise that we have with each other so that we know where we all stand. And when we follow that contract, when we follow the Constitution... Um, then we can kind of relax a little bit because um, we know where we are. And it's a covenant. In marriage, there is a covenant. Now, we're talking about people coming together, whether um, it's in a business arrangement or whether it's as a citizen of a country. Um, and even in the home and marriage, there is a promise. Um, as a preacher, you know, I stand up here at the front and a young lady and, well, Sometimes it's a, an older lady or an older man, um, but usually young people, and they're coming to be married. And of course, um, uh, I have made it my rule that I don't marry anyone outside of our church fellowship. It would be a very unusual thing for me to do that. I did marry uh, my daughter off, but that was an unusual situation. But usually it's just uh, people in church. And so we go through, uh, church, we go through marriage counselling before we ever come to that. We want them to understand uh, who they are with each other and what marriage is all about. Uh, but when they come to the altar to be married, uh, both are giving themselves to each other. It's a covenant. It's a promise. It's a contract, a very serious one. And they promise and they make vows together. Uh, something like, you know, in sickness and in health and for richer, for poorer, to love and to cherish, forsaking all others, keeping myself only for you as my wife or as my husband and uh, for as long as we both shall live. Now that's a covenant and it should never be broken. And you know what? Once the contract is drawn up and the vows are made and the promises are made, you ought to be able to just relax. Um, divorce is never a word that's ever used in our house. It's not a concept we would ever can consider. I mean, if, if something that'd be, if I lost Leslie, it'd be like me losing my right arm and my right leg. Um, part of me would be gone. And so that vow and that promise is sacred and it is so very, very important. And I see it has to do with the relationship between people Together, a covenant is so very important. In salvation, there is a covenant. Did you know that the word testament means covenant? Some might talk about the old covenant or the old testament or the new covenant. 
or the New Testament. And this is a promise that God has made unto us. And what he has promised us is that he has come, as Billy and Sherry sang this morning, that the blood of his son would be the atonement, the atoning price for our sin. He knew that we were all sinners. He knew that we could not ultimately pay the price to satisfy him. And therefore he himself, because of love, came into this world. He was born as a man, uh, the Lord Jesus. And he was a great teacher, but that's not why he came. And he was a great healer, but that's not why he came. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. He came to be the atoning sacrifice for the sin of all humanity. And when he died upon the cross, our sin was laid on his shoulders. And he felt the weight of God's wrath and judgment upon him. And therefore he died in our place. That's what God has promised. That the price that Jesus made is enough to satisfy him. To satisfy the Father for every single sin that you have ever committed from the time you're born to the, to the time you die. But there's another part of that promise because it's a two-way street. Now some people get it all messed up. They think, well, God has promised to do that. And our part is that we have to do good and we have to be uh, faithful and we have to do this and we have to do that and we have to do the other thing. And then what happens is as people feel, we always feel. Therefore, we lose our salvation. Well, what kind of salvation is it? No, they mess it up because the Bible clearly teaches that the number, uh, that the only thing really, now repentance is, is basically re preparing the heart and repentance, true repentance takes place when a man believes. But when you read through the scriptures very, very clearly, the book of Romans, the book of, uh, the, book of the gospel of John, all through the epistles, all through the New Testament, all through the Old Testament, you'll find that a man is justified in the sight of God through his faith. Unto him which worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Sirs, what must we do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And so our part of the covenant, God wants us to understand our need and to change our mind. That's what repentance is. That's all preparatory. But because we believe, we come to him. Say, Lord, I know I'm in trouble. I know I'm guilty. And Lord, I need to be saved. I feel it. I know it. And Lord, I'm crying out for you to save me. I believe upon you. I put my dependence and trust upon you to be my saviour. And that's what God's looking for. And when you meet that condition, then the transaction is made. And God reaches back 2,000 years and he takes the payment that Jesus made for you. And he places it on your account. And that's a, that is a... Um, a transaction that takes place in a moment when you are justified, when you are sanctified positionally, uh, when you belong to him, you're born again, you're redeemed, you're saved. All of that happens because of God's promise. I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. What a wonderful covenant that is. What a wonderful promise in our relationship to God. And you know what? I can relax. I don't have to worry about Dan going to hell. Because I'm resting in him. And in his promise. And there, is a, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. You have to stop from your works. And lean on him and rest on him. And take him at his word. And lean upon his promise. Thank God for salvation. Now today. As we look at this subject. In the church. There is a covenant. Realizing. That we are one together and yet we are many. There's a relationship between each of the members in that body. And so it's important that we know what the expectations are. Now again we live in a strange time. When it comes to New Testament Christianity and teaching about the church. Someone once said it's easier to join the Rotary Club than it is to join a local church. There's more expected of you. In the Lions Club. Than there is um, in the local church. You know some of those um, man made worldly organizations. They require you to pay dues. If you don't pay dues they throw you out. Now, now we don't do that here. But you know there's things that are expected of us. As believers in relationship to one another. And that's what we want to look at. This morning. So first of all. We find that this covenant is a promise. It is a promise. It's a covenant. 
It's a promise that when I join a church, I make to each of the members in that congregation. Now, you know, I don't actually come right to the front and say, now, Miss Jennifer, I promise you this, Brother Mike, I promise you this. But, you know, when you're standing up at the front here and you're joining the church and uh, you're, you're joining a local assembly, really that's what you're doing because you will have already gotten the church constitution, you will have got the church covenant, the articles of faith. And before you ever stand here, I will go to your house and I'll talk to you. And I'll say, now, have you read the Articles of Faith? Yes. Now, do you believe the Articles of Faith? Yes. Well, I'm not quite sure about that. Well, that's okay. We can teach you on that. But do you have a conviction contrary to what we believe? No. Don't, not, because if somebody doesn't believe what we believe, then you need to find a church that believes the same thing you do. So we want to have harmony. How can two walk together except they be agreed? But when you read the church covenant, what you're saying is, I promise my commitment that this is a serious commitment in joining a local church. It's not a free-for-all. Just come and go, do what I like, live how I like, and think that everything is okay. That's not the way it's supposed to be. There's a responsibility that I have when I name the name of Christ. The Bible says, he that names the name of Christ, let him depart from iniquity. In other words, I can't live like the devil and be a member in good standing in a local church and accept it of the church community and think everything's okay with me in the church and everything's okay with me with God and I'm living like the devil. That's not right. But it happens all the time. And you've heard about old cantankerous deacons and they get drunk every Friday night and they, and they all stand out in the front porch smoking all the time. And that, that's, that should not be in a New Testament church. There are requirements. There are standards of holiness and righteousness and commitment that there should be when we join a local church. It's not a free-for-all. And when we join a church, we're making a commitment that we realize there, there are expectations. And so, um, it's a commitment and it's a, it's a promise. And it's a promise that only believers should make. You see, the body is made up of born-again Christians. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, By one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Now that's not the local church. I believe that's the body of Christ. There's people who are not members in local churches, yet they're saved. And they have the Holy Spirit. And they belong to God. Now they're not right if they're not in a local church. But they have been baptized. They've been identified by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. There are also people who are members of local churches and who are not saved because somehow they've got in. And we ask them, are you, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? And they'll tell you before us all. They say, well, yes, I've done that. But how do we know that? How many church services have you been in or church uh, experiences have you maybe had a revival? And uh, a deacon gets saved. A Sunday school teacher gets saved. I've heard stories where the preacher gets saved. Were they members of the church? Yes, but they weren't saved. You could be here this morning, be a member of Calvary Baptist Church and not see him. But you ought to be. And anybody that joins a New Testament church should have a credible profession of faith. And the way that the New Testament patterns it is that is that they publicly identify with Christ. And that they do that through baptism. And they symbolize their, their agreement with and their belief in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so to be a member in a Baptist church, you should be saved. And there should be a credible public profession of that salvation and follow the pattern of the New Testament, which is to be baptized by immersion, which is what baptism is. And so it's a promise. It's a promise made by saved people who are coming together in the local church. Now, the second thing is that this is a promise concerning our worship. Now, some of you have the notes there, and I do want to, I'm going to read this, okay? Um, and I may have to come back here to read it because this is very small. Okay, so we're going to look at this first paragraph. And I, you say, this is the first time I've seen this. No, if you remember in our church, you have it. You would have been given the church constitution and the covenant. Having been led by the Holy Spirit to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and on public confession of our faith, having been immersed in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we do now in the presence of God and this assembly solemnly and joyfully enter into covenant promise with one another as one body in Christ. You see, there's no lone rangers here. We are to be part of the assembly. 
The word church, you remember from our previous lessons, is the Greek word ekklesia, which is called a body of believers. The English word comes from kirk, K-I-R-K. If you're in Scotland, they'll say, let's go to the kirk, which means the church. And the word kirk comes from curion, which is the word for Lord. And, uh, or curios is Lord. Curion means belonging to the Lord. And so the word kirk, which is where we get our English word, means the Lord's or the Lord's people or belonging to the Lord. And so we've come together as the Lord's people. And we have a relationship one with another and a responsibility one with another. I have a responsibility to you. I just can't live any way that the way I used to live and expect you to have a right relationship with me. There's an expectation. There's a promise that we've made one with another. And it, it's concerning our worship. Second paragraph, we purpose therefore by the aid of the Holy Spirit to walk together in Christian love. To strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness and comfort. You know, some people come into a church, even join a church, but they don't really consider it theirs. And how many times, not recently, thank the Lord, but how many times people have, have stuck their finger at me and see, I'll never be back to your church. And see, that's the problem. For them, it's my church. It was never their church. If you're a member in this church, God wants you to consider it your church. This is my church. Now, if God has you in another church, then that church should be your church. There should be ownership. There should be commitment to that particular body. And you should be trying to advance that church and be a blessing to that church and to encourage that church, to serve in that church, to fix the church where it's broken. Maybe, you know, no church is perfect. We're certainly not perfect. And there's things could be improved in this church. So instead of criticizing it, say, Pastor, can we do this? People do this all the time for me. They say, yeah, of course we can do that. And the church gets fixed or the church gets improved because it's our church. It's your church. And so we're for the advancement of it. For the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, comfort, to promote its prosperity and spirituality, to attend its services regularly, to sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, doctrine. In other words, this is, what the church, this, is the, this is what the church believes. This is the direction of the church. We believe this. We're for this. We're supportive. We're behind you. And that's how a church goes forward. Because this is a promise concerning really our vertical relationship to the Lord above. These are all things concerning our worship. They give it sacred preeminence over all institutions of human origin. Now your family is not of human origin. The family is of God. But... Uh, you know, anything else. I was in a pipe band. And I had, as a young Christian, I had to make a decision. Am I going to go to the band or am I going to go to church? And that was a tough one for me because before I got saved, the band was my life. And I was still going to the band instead of going to church for the first um, a few months. And then I had to make a decision. And I did make a decision. And I told the people in the band, the, the band met twice, twice a week. I said, I'll be here on a Monday night, but it won't be here on Thursday night. Our church met on a Thursday night. I says, I'm going to church. I made that decision. Because the church is more important than the band. It really is. It should be. And so sacred preeminence over all institutions of human origin. To give faithfully of time, talent, and activities. To contribute cheerfully and regularly to, as God prospers us. In other words, we promise to support the church financially. You know, uh, you know $10 a month is not really supporting it. But, I mean, I'm not even going to get into that. But, and that's, that's, that's between you and the Lord. I don't know who gives what in this church. Um, but if it's, if it's where God has placed me, and then I want to sacrificially give that the church might be prosperous and send out missionaries and all of those things. And that's what goes on to the relief of the poor, the spread of the gospel throughout all nations. And so our, our worship uh, is so very important. And Hebrews 10 uh, if I just look there at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and, and verse 25, these are verses we, we know very well, uh, but it's important. And I know this is a strange kind of message this morning because we're not really in a, a passage of scripture. We're going through this, this particular topic, um, but it's important. And the scriptures, everything that I'm saying to you, the scriptures back this up. It supports it. The whole New Testament is, is about uh, most of the New Testament is given to churches other than 
um, you know, Titus and and uh, First and Second Timothy, uh, which were pastors of churches. It's all about the church. In Hebrews ten verse twenty four. He says, and let us consider one another. Who? In the church. As believers, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Because we have a relationship one with another. It's a one body, but it's various and different members. And so in verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see that they're approaching. And so you cannot worship together if we're not together. you got to come. And that's the promise that we're making. The second part, or the third part of the promise here, is that uh, this, is, this is a promise concerning our walk. And so, if the first part of this covenant has to do with our worship, and in our church, we're worshiping together, we're promoting the ministry of the church and serving in the church, then the walk part has to do with our testimony as a church, our testimony as believers to the world at large. Okay, in fact, look at Colossians uh, chapter number 4. Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. And again, this kind of harkens back to the message that we preached about the different relationships that we have, the, the three different directions. We have a direction above to the Lord, uh, our worship to God who is above. We have a, a relationship within. We're to edify the saints within. And then uh, we are to have a relationship to those who are without. We're to evangelize those who are without. So this promise concerning our walk has to do with our testimony and the relationship that we as believers and as a church have to the unsaved people outside the walls of this church. And so Paul says in Colossians 4 and verse 5 and 6, Colossians chapter 4, uh, verse 5 and 6, uh, he says, Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. So we have a relationship not only with each other, but we also have a relationship as a testimony outside this church, uh, redeeming the time, taking advantage of all the opportunities that God gives us to be a good testimony to those who are without. Um, and then verse 6, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. We have a responsibility in the way that we walk. So let's read this one. He says, we also purpose to maintain family and private devotions. To train our children according to the word of God. If you're saved, your first responsibility is to your family. What about your children? Have they heard the gospel? You say, well, I take them to church for that. Well, I'm glad you take them to church. By the way, some people send them to church. Don't send your children to church. Bring them to church. VBS, don't send them to VBS. Bring them to VBS. Because your actions will speak louder than your words. They're watching what you do. And so our first responsibility is in the home. But just don't be relying upon the Sunday school teacher to teach your children the gospel or the word of God. That's your responsibility. We will reinforce that. The Sunday, when we don't have a Sunday school right now, but we will. And we have, well, we have children's church and we have jam club. And those teachers will reinforce what you're doing in the, in the home. But it's your first responsibility. It's our walk. It's our relationship to those who are not saved. Um, to train our children according to the word of God. To seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintances. To walk circumspectly in the world. To be just in our dealing. So our home, our, our relatives uh, were witnessing. Um, when I first got seen, I, I witnessed, first of all, to the people who knew me the best, which was my family. And my brother got saved. Later, my sister got saved. My mom and dad started to come to church. In fact, when I walked forward to volunteer to serve the Lord, they walked forward as well. They rededicate their lives and they got right with God. I was just as well they did because I had to then tell them I was going to go to America to go to Bible school. And they're saying, what? <laughs> you know. But the influence that you have with your family and relatives, and that's really, really important. And really, you should try to invite them to come to church. Now, many of you have done that, and maybe that's all petered out a long time ago, and they, they just won't want to come anymore, but we should be trying to bring our family and our relatives and our neighbors and our friends and our workmate and our school people, the people that we know we should be bringing to church. And, you know, if we're... If we're enthused about the ministry of the church and we're excited about it, then that shouldn't be a problem. If you're embarrassed about your church, that's an issue. That's a problem. There's something either wrong with the church or your relationship to the church. And so he talks about our walk. To walk circumspectly. The word circumspectly means to look around. It means to, be, to walk carefully, to live your life carefully. Um, to walk circumspectly in the world, to be just in our dealings. You know, Christians should be honest. If you're selling stuff, 
I bought, I bought something recently and there was things wrong with it that the guy didn't tell me. I sold the car one time and I, I listed about 13 or 14 things that was wrong with the car. And everything I knew was wrong with that car was on that sheet of paper. And the guy was wanting to buy it and he wanted it cheap. And I says, well, look, there's the price and that's, that's what's wrong with it. He didn't buy it. <laughs> but, you know, you should be honest with people. You know, when you're, when you're buying something, you're kicking the tires and, and you're saying, oh, that's not worth that. And you, and you undercut the guy and you don't give him as much as it's worth. That's not right either. If it's worth it, pay the price that it's worth. Because your testimony as a Christian rides on that. If they find out, and they should know that you're a Christian, if they know you're a Christian, and you have diddled them and been dishonest with them, and they felt that they've been cheated, you have lost more than what you ever gained. And the price that you got for that thing, or whatever it might have been. Christians should have a good testimony. I think I've told you this before. When I first started pastoring in Belfast, we used to go, we used to get, um, what was it we got? I think it was like toner or something for a photocopier. And I went to a, an office building in Belfast and the guy says, well now, um, do you want me to run through, this, through the books? Um, uh, this is the price if you run it through the books. This is the price if you don't run it through the books. And I was, I was, I was just stupid. And he says, well, give me the best price. And I was doing that for three or four months before I realized what he was saying was it wasn't going through the books, so it wasn't being taxed. Now, the, the VAT tax over there is 21%. And so we were, we were saving 21% as a church. And then one day I realized, this guy knows I'm a thief. I'm robbing the government. I had to go back to the guy and say, you know what? I apologize. I'm, this, this is wrong. And he says, you charge me what's supposed to be charged. And God convicted me about that because Christians should have a good testimony. This promise that we're making to each other means that, hey, in business, I'm going to be honest. I'm not going to be a crook. Because you know what? They're going to say, uh, Tom Phyllis, yeah, he's the pastor up at that church. Man, he's a, he's a fly man. That's an Irish term. means he's a crook. No, you want, the, the, and, and, the, and the pastor, obviously, but uh, yeah, they go to that church down there and, you know, they're underhanded. Um, potty mouth. They're profane. Whatever that might be that is wrong. When we join a church, we're promising that's not the way we're living anymore. There's a responsibility that we have to live right before the world. That has to do with our walk. He says that we are to, it says that we're to be exemplary in our conduct. Avoid all gossip, backbiting, unrighteous anger. You know, even as you're driving your car and somebody cuts you off. And that would never happen in McMinnville, I'm sure. But, you know, and maybe people don't know who you are, but maybe they do know who you are. And if you're giving them all of this here, that's not right. You need to calm down and say, you know what? I have a Christian testament, especially if you have a scripture verse on the bumper of your car. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. So... He sa it says here to abstain from all, of, all forms of activity which dishonor the Lord Jesus Christ, stumbling to a fellow believer or hinder the winning of a soul to Christ. You see what I'm talking about? If I'm, a, if I'm the preacher and I'm out here smoking, most people know that's wrong. It hurts your body. It's a bad testimony. It's addictive. It's not a good example. Do you want your kids to smoke? No, you shouldn't smoke. You shouldn't chew. You shouldn't run around with the girls that do, right? You shouldn't do anything like that that has been a bad testimony. Now, we all know this, but what I'm saying is sometimes we need to be reminded of these things that I have a testimony. First of all, I'm a Christian. I name the name of Christ. I'm to depart from iniquity, um, whether I belong to a church or not. If I belong to Christ, then I have to have a testimony. But if I belong to a church, that reflects on that church. It reflects on everybody in that church. The testimony of the church is my testimony. It's your testimony. What the world thinks about our church is what the world thinks about you. And what the Lord thinks about Jesus, or what the world thinks about Jesus, what people see about you. If someone said you're the, you're the closest Bible that someone will ever read. They're reading your life. And so what we're saying is, this is a promise. It's a contract. It's a covenant. It's a very serious thing. It has to do with our worship of God within the church and the ministry of the church. It has to do with my life outside the walls of this church, in my deportment, and in my testimony. And then lastly... This is a promise concerning our watch. That means insane. Look over at Ephesians chapter 4. Just back a few pages. Ephesians 4 verse 29. 
And this is really important, isn't it? Because we have to treat each other right. Now, not, not just that we have to, we ought to want to. It should be natural that we want to do this. The Bible says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And we brought some messages on that topic. When church is done right, it's fantastic. It's a little, like a little bit of heaven. But sometimes it's not always done right. And there's problems. But in Ephesians 4, Paul addressed, you know, church relationships are as old as the Bible itself. And he says in verse 29 of Ephesians 4, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. Are you turning people down or are you building them up with your words? That it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you're sealed unto the, 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 the day of redemption. Look at these next two verses. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Who's he talking to? He's talking to Christians. He's talking to the church at Ephesus that we learned about two weeks ago. These are real people in a real church. And yet they had these, still these real problems, like some of us do. In verse 32, notice he says, And be ye kind one to another. You know, if there's, any, if there's ever any place where you should bump into kindness, it should be right here. All of us should be kind one to another. Be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, tender hearted. The Bible talks about easy to be entreated. That you can talk to somebody. They're not. Uppity and being a, what's the word now, a Karen, you know, that's a new word now, Karen. Can't talk to them. No, he says, be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. You see, this has to do with our, our, our relationships inside the church. Okay, so here's what the promise is. We further purpose to encourage one another. We encourage one another in all things, but in the blessed hope of the Lord's return. In other words, Jesus is coming. We talk about that a lot here, where we got the upward look. And to watch one another in brotherly love. You know, when somebody stops coming to the church here, um, I either call them, or I go by to see them, or I text them. And if they're, they're not coming, they, you know, they get a visit for several times. And I have to say, most of the time it doesn't work. I don't know why. And we go in kindness and grace, and we say, you know, what's the problem? Can we help you? But they just made up their mind. They don't want to come. And it's the hardest, for me, it's the hardest part of ministry. Because I love people, and I like them to be here, and I want to be in the right relationship with them. And then people just walk off. They don't even tell you why they walk off, and they don't come anymore. You see, there's people who despise the church. You'll find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. There's people who discourage the church. There's people who desert the church. They will criticize the church, all oh, ruthlessly. But they never actually talk to the people who would, could do something about that. That's not right. Because God, Jesus loves the church. You say, well, you're just done because you're the preacher and, and this is your, your ministry and this is your church. Well, it is. Of course it is. But you know what? There's going to be a time I'm not going to be here. And my honest prayer and desire for this church is that it will go on for until Jesus comes. And the reason we should be loyal to a particular church is, is not because, you know, that we're anything special. But it's that Jesus loves this church and he loves the program of the church. He, know, he loves the mission of the church. He loves what goes on here. You know, on, on Sunday nights, we're talking about the seven churches of Asia Minor. And Jesus is, and those are the candlesticks. And Jesus is in the midst of the candlesticks. And he's walking in the midst of the candlesticks. He's walking in the midst of the churches because he's interested in what's going on. And the seven letters, which we're talking about on Sunday night, he's, he, he tells, he says, this is what you're doing right. And then he says, but I've got something against you because there's something wrong. Jesus is very interested in the church. I'm telling you, far more than I ever could be or you could ever be. And so the reason we should be wanting to treat the church right is because he's interested in that. And one day we're going to have to stand before the Lord and give an account of those things. And so he says, we've got to watch one another. You know, care for one another. And you know, we have this in the church. When somebody's sick, people call. We, I mean, people, we send food over. We, we try to help people when they're going through difficult times. And especially if they're depressed or they're going through difficult times, our heart goes out and we want to show sympathy. We want to honor people. Last week, we had Donna Wilma here. We wanted to honor this couple in the loss of their son 50 years ago. 
And he goes on to say, to aid each other in sickness and distress, to cultivate Christian sympathy and feeling and courtesy and speech, to be slow to take offense, but always ready for reconciliation. You know, if you, if you offended me, which I never, you know, I don't think anybody's offended me. <laughs> Maybe you have, but I, I don't remember it. But if you did offend me, some people you think, oh, the preacher's mad at me. I'm not mad at you. I don't know enough to be mad at you. But even if I, what, even if I did know enough to be mad at you, I would choose not to be mad at you because I love you. And I would seek to help you. I'm not mad at you. God's not mad at you. And we shouldn't be mad at each other. And if he said, uh, Pastor, I, I, did, I did this wrong and, and I know you're offended, I'd say, you know, don't worry about it. It's all right. Do you know how much I've been forgiven? It's easy for people who have been forgiven to forgive others. And that's what he says, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God for Christ's sake has forgiven us. And moreover, we purpose that when we remove from this place, we will as soon as possible unite with another church of like faith and practice. See, church is really important. If I left this church, I'd be looking for another church. Immediately, I'd be looking for another church. And I would seek to join that church. You see, no church is perfect. Our church is not perfect. And I'm not a perfect preacher by any stretch of the imagination. I get things wrong all the time. And I'm grateful for your tenderness and your forgiving of me. But you know, when people get upset at the church and they leave, where are you going to go? Well, sometimes it'll go anywhere, which is not right. Because if you're a Christian, or if you're a disciple, and you're following the Lord. You can't be divorced from the church. You've got to be in church somewhere. But I don't like that church. Don't like the preacher. Okay. Well, you go to the next, next church. You know what's going to happen? You're going to find problems there too. You're also going to find uh, the preacher's got idiosyncrasies that you don't like as well. What are you going to do with that? You know, no church is going to be perfect. But if you're a disciple, you're, as long as you're drawing breath on this planet, you've got to be with the church. We are inseparable. It's the only way we can follow the Lord. It's the only way we can disciple others. It's the only way we can be disciple is in the ministry of the local church. It's so important. And so this message today is about the promise of the church. It's not the promise of some group or some hierarchy or some preacher promising you something. That's not what we're talking about. We are the church. I have, I have the possession and the privilege of being the oversight and the shepherd of the flock. And I'm very grateful for that. But you know what? In a Baptist church, it's one member, one vote. And that means that I'm, I'm a member in the body as you're a member in the body. And it's not that, you know, there's some centralized group that's promising you something. No, this is a body. Like this hand and this ear is joined together. It's all part of the same. And you'll read it, um, I'm, I'm, I'm over time right now, but in Second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you read on through the rest of the chapter, he says that there be no schism in the body, but that the, the, the church would have the same care, the members would have the same care one of another. If one member is honored, the whole body rejoices. If one member suffers, the whole body suffers. If this hand, if I hit that, I've told you this before, you know, if I hit my thumb with a hammer, it's not just the thumb that's hurting the whole body's hurting. And brother hand comes over to brother thumb and he sticks him in brother mouth, you know. And the whole body is ministering because we're all together. That's the way it's supposed to be. And one of the things that we're doing with this series, this is the, this is, I'm just, this, these notes it will be a new members class. And so what we want to do when people want to join the church is I want to take them through those lessons because I want them to understand when you're joining the church, it is a, it's a promise. And then you can relax. We know where we stand. We know what's expected. But it's what the Lord, it's the promise that we make to each other. We have a responsibility to each other. We never think about that, but I thought it would be good to think about it this morning. And I hope that it has meant something to you as it has meant to me. Maybe you're here this morning, you're not a member of a church. If you're saved, you should, the pattern of the New Testament is you should be a member in the church. Not just that you attend the church, you should promise to be a part of that fellowship. That's the pattern. You'll not find anything in the New Testament that's different than that. And so if you're saved, you should be a member of a church. Now, we'd love it for it to be this one, but if it's not this one, it should be some church somewhere that you can be in fellowship together. That's the pattern. My job as the messenger boy is to tell you what God says about it. 
And so I would encourage you, if you're saved and you're not a member, join the church. Join this church. And if you haven't got a church constitution, well, you have it right here on the covenant, but um, you could come forward this morning and say, Pastor, I'd like to join the church. And what we would do is we would come and talk to you and we would give you the constitution and we would encourage you all that we could. And um, you don't have to come forward this morning. Maybe you just say to me, before you leave today, Pastor, I'd like to get that constitution. I'd like you come talk to me about it. I'd be happy to do that. You'll never regret that. And uh, if you have been recently saved, it would be a good thing to let people know about it. See, that'd be embarrassing. Hey, we're all in the same boat. We all went through the same thing. Yeah, we were kind of embarrassed too, a little bit. Nobody wants to stand in front of people. But you know what? It would be good for us. It would be good for you. To let people know, hey, I got seen. Amen. Everybody in here would be rejoicing. We'd go home rejoicing this morning to hear news like that. It'd be fantastic. How do you get seen? Understand your need. And come to him and say, Lord, I trust you to meet my need. What you did on the cross, I receive. I believe upon you. Save me, Lord. And the Bible says that he will. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Shall we pray?